Hello, everyone. This is Case Study QB, and I'm back again here in the Progressive War Room with Jamila Medley, and she is an organizational development consultant, leadership coach, and educator slash advocate for solidarity, solidarity economy, and she holds an MS degree in organizational dynamics from the University of Pennsylvania. Jamila, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me for this chat. Yeah, I, I was. I met you um, about a month ago and found out what you're doing. I was so excited to um, have you on and talk to you more about what you do. So first, let's get into it. So uh, tell me about what you do and your services. Yeah, so organizational development consultant. People are like, what does that mean? <laughs> Um, I think I, I think of my work as um, deeply relational. Mm -hmm. um, people come together in groups, right, to do all kinds of things together, um, whether it's, you know, to um, form a business, to make social clubs, we, we want to travel and hang out together. We're always kind of like organizing. And I think at the um, center of organizing, of course, is people. And so my work as an organizational development consultant is usually working within, um, sometimes these look like formal groups, like, you know, um, incorporated businesses and nonprofits. Um, they might also be um, loosely held grassroots um, kind of activities that people are organizing around an issue. And my work tends to focus on helping people learn how they want to be together okay. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so that could include things um around governance right mm -hmm. so thinking about um we have a business an organization uh, i usually work with organizations um with cooperatively owned organizations and they all have boards of directors mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of work in support of um, helping people navigate governance and usually from a values driven um, place where people are um, prioritizing people over profit. We think about the three P's in our work, people, planet and profit. Right. And so I try to spend a lot of time helping people imagine how to be fair and just mm -hmm. and kind and um, you know, caring and loving to each other, even yeah. within when you show up to go to work, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? That doesn't, it's not reserved for, um, for home or just you like your close people. It's like, how do we want to be in relationships with each other? So I help people okay. with that kind of work. And then I also do a lot of work around planning. Um, I, I usually work with organizations when they're at the crest, they're cresting, they're kind of like coming upon some major change that is about to happen or they've sure. kind of realized that a change needs to happen. And so mm. I might walk with them um, through that change and of trend towards transformation. Your major was organizational dynamics. Was that what you that specialized in? When I started, I worked in um, nonprofit organizations okay. Um, okay. across a lot of different issues. And whether they were small or big, mm -hmm. I just was like really curious, like, there's something about the people part here. It's like the people that make things great or the people that make things bad. What's going on? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so um, that became how I kind of stum I stumbled upon the field of organizational development, yeah. where it is an opportunity to help people more intentionally determine um, the plans and what, you know, how they're going to run their organizations um, mm -hmm. and what they want their outcomes to be and how they're going to be successful. And like I said, all of that, in my experience, is really rooted in how people choose to relate to one another in order to reach a particular performance um, goal. So something I'm very curious about, maybe I'll ask you this towards the end of the interview, about horizontal and vertical organizational structures. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm working on the Mutual Aid Party, and I just brought on a partner to help me with this initiative. And I, I was thinking about it before bringing him on. I was like, how do I want to structure? Because eventually we're, we're going to form a 501c4. We're going to create the bylaws. And we were thinking about how I was thinking about before even bringing him on. How do I want to structure this organization? I don't want it to um, be a, a top down 
So mm -hmm. instead of having a board of directors, I was even thinking of the name facilitators. And I actually came across the word facilitator. I think it was on your website because facilitator to me means more of a director's like, I'm directing you to do this. You have to do, you know, it kind of gives off that kind of connotation where a facilitator is like, hey, we're doing this together. I might have this opinion and this idea, but we're all, everything that we do, we do it together. So mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna talk to you about that. But um, the next question that I have for you is who would hire you for your services? Typically I'm working with um, nonprofits, within the solidarity economy movement. And I guess we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I also work, you know, I work with, um, my, my preference and what I'm fortunate to be able to do is to work with people that I wanna work with. So that means that I need to have values alignment with my clients. Um, I have to understand, or we have to have a certain understanding of where we are <laughs> together in our journey and how we're going to support each other in going there. And usually I find those folks um, who are, whether they know they're a part of the solidarity economy or not, they might be very adjacent to it, doing solidarity economy building things because it's a very, just an, the solidarity economy is a natural thing that human beings do. <laughs> um, and so when, when groups are organized that way, I can usually come in and support them um, in their efforts towards transformation and change and growth. And sometimes just kind of like figuring out how do we, how do we stabilize? How do we even keep what we have that's working really well, working well. Um, so nonprofits and cooperatively owned businesses, um, I'll do work with in philanthropy. A lot of my work is at this intersection of, um, working in philanthropy, uh, within the nonprofit industrial <laughs> Uh, complex and mm. with cooperatively owned businesses. How were you introduced to cooperatives? Yeah. Um, so as I was completing grad school, I started looking for um, a job and um, an, an acquaintance of mine was working at a food co-op. I live in Philadelphia in West Philly, um, or I did at the time. And um, so she encouraged me to apply for a membership position, a membership coordinator position at Mariposa Food Co-op. Um, and I had done um, membership engagement kinds of work in other nonprofits. So I figured, oh, okay, I can help bring in members and figure out how to get benefits and do things with members. I know how to do that stuff. So I applied for the position. I got it. And um, I actually... I didn't know anything about co-ops. So when I first started, there was actually another organization, um, a grassroots group actually being formed called the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance. And these were a group of people who belonged to cooperatives, who were staff at cooperatives or worked at cooperatives who wanted to organize to um, kind of like really answer this question, like what would happen if different co-ops started organizing together to build a more cooperative and solidarity economy? And so I decided to volunteer for that organization so that I could learn about co-ops <laughs> because my job was to help bring in new members to the food co-op. I needed to be able to have a game, have something to talk about with people. Um, and so from there, as I was volunteering, I recognized that one of the things I really admired about people who were in this in the co-op movement was that they weren't looking for handouts, they weren't looking for charity, they were self-determined and self-organizing, right? It's like we're gonna help ourselves by helping each other. And you know, in the nonprofit and charitable sector, so much of it is about like you know, some big nonprofit or foundation or somebody saying like, oh, we can do this for you. Um, and these folks were out here saying like, we can do this for ourselves. Um, so that's what really kind of like got me, my heart kind of like hooked in the work was being able to leverage my skills and experience into supporting people and myself to help ourselves. Um, and that's kind of like how my cooperative journey began. You touched on the the nonprofit industrial complex. So I, I wanted to. So of course that has a negative connotation in my mind as far as like the military industrial complex. So you mm. deal more with the nonprofit industrial. You called it not me industrial complex. 
give dig into that a little bit. What's some good things? I, I didn't want to just brush right past that. I was like, let me go back to that. I mean, mm. I'm going to give a very abridged and hopefully accurate mm. kind That's of um, reporting on this. But I think, you know, when we look historically at it, particularly in the United States, at how kind of like charities were uh, created and invented, we have to go back to thinking about, um, you know, particularly in the early, early 20th century when we had like, Fords and Rockefellers and all of these like ultra wealthy um, white men who were engaged in all kinds of practices within their businesses that were deeply exploitive of people and planet, um, actively causing harm along the way. And at the same time, um, you know, there's the government also trying to say, y'all got a whole lot of money. Y'all should be paying these taxes, right? And so the tax system emerges and rules emerge, which also allow um, folks to be like, if you give away some money, you get tax breaks, right? So in some way, we have this emergence of a system where wealthy people um, who are um, controlling a big parts of the economy, controlling labor, controlling lots of resources, are able to then say, you know what? We see that there are like efforts on the ground to like try to help, you know, feed the hungry, house um, the unhoused, take care of orphan children and widows and what have you. And so there was this conf conflagration of like the wealthy and these kind of projects that are happening and getting organized uh, systemically <laughs> and both like at, um, and what I mean by systemically is that it becomes part of like how the government kind of like also organizes through our tax structure, right? And so you get this um, this system, right, that we kind of like think about in philanthropy and charity where people who have a lot of money are able to say, I want to give away my money and do some good things with it. In the meantime, I might also be getting some kickback, tr tremendous, um, what do you want to say, tax write-offs and benefits. Um, I might be even able to some degree to control political outcomes. I might to some degree be able to control um, local um, environmental or just kind of like community-based things that are happening because with money often comes a lot of influence and power. And so the system kind of emerges where, you know, you know, there are at least, and I don't know, probably more now, mil a million nonprofit organizations in the United mm -hmm. States, right? From hospitals and churches and yeah. universities yeah. to um, soup kitchens and food pantries. And, <laughs> you know, all of these systems are set up, right? In a way where the people who are doing the work to affect change and to help have to consistently go to philanthropy, the people with money, um, power and influence to ask them for what they need to meet, to help people meet their basic needs in society. So mm. that structure in many ways is um, intentional. <laughs> mm. It is, um, it's a century old at least, and mm. it is, um, deeply continues to be extractive of the people who work in service for this um for it within nonprofits as well as the communities that they often serve. And so we tend to some you know I didn't I don't recall exactly who coined the term the nonprofit industrial complex, but we see this kind of like challenge of like they're trying to be good happening, mm -hmm. right? But we come up against these systems that impede just how good and beneficial you can really be because mm -hmm. of who's controlling um, your ability to actually do that. Now I do work also, um, I mentioned earlier, you know, I do work in, in philanthropy. Um, I work, I serve on the board of, um, of a foundation, a local foundation mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. I have clients that work and serve um, in philanthropy. And so there is an effort and a project and movement happening now um, where philanthropists are really trying to change how they show up to do their work, how they distribute their wealth, how they um, move from a power over to a power with 
uh, relationship mm. with their partners on the ground who are actually doing the work. So there's an interesting shift happening yeah. now. People are considering where their money comes from and how they got it um, and how they want to responsibly um, you know, give it back to the people that it belongs to, honestly, <laughs> which is yeah, us. Right. Yeah. Right? And to yep. do that in just and fair ways. No, definitely. That's why I wanted to get your insight from for somebody who works a lot closer to uh, nonprofits than I do. And I, I've also heard recently uh, critics of, uh, you know, what's going on in Haiti and uh, the unfortunate um, governmental turmoil that, uh, man, that's a whole other conversation. But one of the things that I, I watched in the interview recently, they talked about how the NGOs, which stands for non-governmental organization, which it, I don't know if it can be considered a nonprofit, but basically when a lot of money is raised um, from what this interviewer said there, the money is sent first to the NGOs, even before going to like the Haitian government itself, where, where it can then be distributed to the people who need it. It goes to the NGOs first, who they decide who to give them this money that um, is raised for Haiti. And, and that, and, and it talks about how problematic that could be because you go to where all the volunteers are and they're living in Haiti much better than the actual people who are starving mm -hmm. and all these different things. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. where these non-governmental NGOs or philanthropies can, you know, they can have good intentions, but you have to, we have to look out for, you know, the negative side of things. So thank you for giving me your, your opinion yeah. of the uh, industrial complex of nonprofits. <laughs> What is your definition of a solidarity economy? Solidarity economy. Because we know right now we have the capitalistic economy. We live in America. So that's the main thing that's always promoted. Oh, we're capitalists. Uh, even in the hip hop industry, I'm a hustler. I'm a, I'm a hustler is one of the, you know, anthems that is preached. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I'm not going to sleep until I die. I'm always going to be getting money. But yeah. you know you're yeah. you've, you're an advocate for this uh, solidarity economy, so I, mm -hmm. I would love to know what you think about that. Um, so you might you know Google and find different definitions <laughs> for a solidarity mm -hmm. economy. I'll speak to my my own experience, kind of like participating in it and how mm -hmm. I've come That's to um, to kind of like hold it as meaningful for myself. Um, <laughs> I think about the solidarity economy as the real economy, as the most ancient economy, um, which is built around reciprocity, trust, um, and relationships, right? It's about people being able to exchange, right? Um, goods, talents, gifts, um, <laughs> resources, in order to support one another and, and effectively meet one another's needs, right? And human beings have always done this kind, these kinds of activities, and people continue to do these kinds of activities. So they can be, you know, activities that include um, loan funds, susus, and like, you know, we're gonna pool our money together, and over time, each of us is gonna have a chance to pull from the pot to meet a need, right? But we we form this relationship that if we all give something, we can all get something in return, right? Maybe you wanna go to on vacation, but somebody else needs to pay tuition, right? But there's a, there's a pot that we can all contribute to and we can hold together and trust how it gets distributed and how it's returned, right? Um, it can be formations of cooperatives, right? businesses or enterprises where associations of people democratically own and control an enterprise, right? So it's like we have a common um, economic, social, or cultural need, and we're going to self-organize in a way to meet those needs ourselves. So the solidarity economy is how people have always taken care of themselves and each other. And it is way older than capitalism, <laughs> right? And it and it survives everything because when capitalism fails us, we constantly come back to each other as we experienced 
um, you know, particularly in the 2020s, being in the pandemic with the rise of the racial, um, you know, the racial justice uprisings that happened, we saw so much solidarity economy building happening as people realized that they weren't going to get saved, <laughs> right, by the government or big corporations or their local foundations. They were going to have to find ways to take care of themselves and each other. And people constantly return to these cons we, we constantly activate these um these kinds of tools, you know, even if it's like moms organizing around babysitting, <laughs> right? Like I want a date night, right? Or so like we rotate and take turns watching each other's kids or I'll babysit while you do my kid's hair, right? So like there's all kinds of ways that are just really basic in which we can see these kinds of cooperative economic activities happening mm -hmm. that undergird what we, you know, there there's a technical, I think, um, activity and a movement that was really originated in um, Latin America, um, particularly in the 1990s, where we saw some internal or some like specific kind of framing and structures created where we get the language that we kind of talk about with social economy and solidarity economy building. Um, but the activity of it has always happened and is always here and is always saving us and helping us thrive. Yeah, I always wonder, um, and like you said, this is one of the oldest it was here even before capitalism. Capitalism, you know, it originated with trading um, gold and using gold as a currency of coins, metal coins, and then it eventually came into cash. And I always wondered if there's a way that we can have a, a solidarity economy currency, like uh, whether it's um, some kind of and it can be exchanged digital, digitally, meaning like you can go to a, a farmer's market and let's say I, I have a vegetable garden in my backyard and I have a whole bunch of cucumbers and I have an over amount of cucumbers that I don't need. Once a week, there's, I know of this solidarity um, farm, uh, farmer's market, and I'll take the excess amount of cucumbers there and mm -hmm. I can say any, anyone, um, who needs cucumbers and when they take it they just scan you know a phone and we can have an app where i get the at least get some kind of credit for giving my cucumbers away to whoever needs it and then i'm building up some kind of uh currency where hey i need someone to watch my kids hey look i've done all this great amount of good giving out cucumbers and in somebody in some way and i'm sure there's a lot it's a lot more um complex than what i'm thinking of but i think that would be a systemic way of growing the solidarity economy if we find a fair and a way that doesn't turn into capitalism i don't want it to turn into capitalism right. but a, a way that is us coming together outside of that capitalist system to help one another what right. do you think I mean, I, I think there are some um, there are some things that make the solidarity economy possible um, that can help it not turn into <laughs> capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, I always say this, you know, like I work in co-ops, and people often think that co-ops are like this alternative to capitalism, right? Like if you mm -hmm. are a co-op, you are inherently anti-capitalist, and that is not mm -hmm. true. Cap mm -hmm. Co-ops co-opted, <laughs> yeah, um, for capitalist gains, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we operate um, within the system of um, capitalism, which means that as we are trying to do these kinds of activities. Um, the pressure to capitalize off of them is real. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? Mm -hmm. So what undergirds the solidarity economy isn't the activity. It's actually the rule, the rules, how our beliefs, right, and our values that mm -hmm. we put into place to deal with the problems we have and mm -hmm. to help us understand um, how we're going to decide what to do to meet, you know, to solve our problems together. And so there might be some like core um, values that people think about when it comes to solidarity economy. 
Um, you can think of it as a framework, right? So like you have this activity mm -hmm. that happens that allows people to get their needs met, right? We can produce things, we can create things, um, we can consume things, we can exchange things, all of that can be happening. But what mm -hmm. makes solidarity economy possible and work is that it's built on cooperation, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We're choosing to cooperate with one another. We're also trying to do that democratically, right? Mm -hmm. So without... Yeah. Um, creating systems that allow more some people to have more power than others, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This kind of work democratically. We're also concerned about justice, right? We know that in um, in the societies in which we live, there are all kinds of um, anti-oppressive uh, systems, right? Whether it's um, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia. Um, mm -hmm. Got education privilege, you got religious privilege, whatever. We are all kind of like constantly being bombarded by having to integrate and, and deal with these intersections, right? And how do we do that with a social justice kind of lens to the work that we're doing? We're also having to think about environmental sustainability, right? Like we can't just be like growing cucumbers and poison in the land, right? So yeah. we have to mm -hmm. like keep that mm -hmm. in there. And we mm -hmm. want to keep mutualism centered, right? We want to make sure that everybody is going to benefit from this, right? That we're not extracting from one another as we're doing this work. And so those kinds of print to, um, values are what's going to help us um, engage in this kind of economy building in a way that treats people well, right? It, put, it prioritizes um, people and planet. And then I work on this um, project called the Solidarity Economy Principles Project because we're talking about a way of being that under white supremacy and capitalism, we are not encouraged to cooperate or to do a lot of things democratically. Mm. And so we don't learn how to do those things overwhelmingly. Um, you know, when we're in school, the way that we're taught to vote is um, majority rules. Well, do you know that there are other ways to vote where the majority doesn't have to rule <laughs> to make decisions, okay. to, right? Where the majority mm -hmm. does not have to rule. Um, and so part of what the Solidarity Economy Principles Project does is it tries to support people in thinking about what are the underlying principles and practices that we need to like learn <laughs> in mm -hmm. order to live out these values, right? It doesn't just come we say it we have to we have to learn we have to do a lot of unlearning and learning some new ways too okay wow that sounds very interesting and uh i would definitely love to i'm going to come back and ask you an example of a government system where the majority doesn't rule but i want to touch on something that you said at the beginning which is that cooperatives can be co-opted by capitalism as well and I, when, as soon as you said that i thought of an interview i did with sharma sawant and um, I featured a clip where she um, organized a protest against the cooperative, <laughs> but it, it was like a, um, it was like a, I forgot the exact name, but it was not a worker owned cooperative. It was a, a different type of cooperative where they still had like a one owner and the workers had to um, protest because they wanted to get uh, more money during the pandemic. Um, so, okay. so you're absolutely correct where you say that even, even cooperatives can be co-opted. So I'm definitely conscious of, uh, making sure that any ideas, any new ideas doesn't get a co-opted by capitalism. And uh, I was even thinking of with this kind of idea, I was thinking in my head, like maybe there's a, a maximum amount of credits that you can build up. So almost like if I was to bring this idea to capitalism, it would be a maximum wage so I, I think, you know, we have a minimum wage, but I also think we should have a maximum wage, whether mm. it's maybe one million instead of we having billionaires and there is a prediction of having our first trillionaire by like 2050 or something like that. Um, there should be a maximum wage on uh, how much someone can make in a year. And mm. I was thinking, OK, if they're not, you know, I, I, I can't fathom that they don't even want to give us a twenty five dollar minimum wage. I can't fathom <laughs> them saying, oh, we're going to put a maximum wage, you know, on how much somebody can make. But I say if we're building this solidarity economy currency, we should have these kind of principles built in on that side. But um, while we're talking about like how digital 
uh, technologies can maybe um, enter the solidarity uh, space, economy space. I'm curious if you have any ideas or thought about how AI can possibly take part in the solidarity uh, economy. Um, I do not, because <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a young, but I'm a, what am I? I'm a Gen Xer and I have not caught mm -hmm. up yet to whatever is happening in the AI world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. And, okay. Um, mm -hmm. If, you know, like, I'd be happy to like share um, some resources that I'm aware of because you know they, these conversations are definitely happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. By, um, in 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 that sector, I'm just mm -hmm. not the person to answer those kinds okay. of questions. Okay, okay. I was just curious. No, no worries. <laughs> I just thought of that idea because that's something I also kind of thought about. I was like, you know, Medicare for all or universal yeah. um, health care has been an idea that has come into the ether since Bernie Sanders yeah. kind of popularized it more, even though he didn't invent that idea, but he popularized it more into the public. I was thinking like, if there, there are AI doctors or AI machines, like let's say I can go to um, buy a, a watch that can tell me exactly what's going on with my body, but it's mm -hmm. a lot cheaper than going to a doctor. I go to the doctor, I get a $300 bill, because they're doing, you know, making sure I'm not I have allergies to a certain thing. And this and this is me telling my story. I'm telling on myself right now. Mm -hmm. Literally, I had bad um as eczema. And maybe about three years ago, I did they did a scratch test to um test for all the various things like pine, what type of trees yeah. you can relate to, roaches, even all these little things that um you can dust mites. And I'm thinking, okay, I got my insurance. I paid the co um the copay. That I, like a, a couple of weeks later, I get a bill in the uh, in the mail for like three hundred dollars for that same little thing. And I'm like, what's going yeah. on? So anyway, um, so that's something yeah. that I, I was I was thinking about. We can move on. So I want to ask you, uh, have you thought about how the government can play? What role the government can play in the solidarity? economy and where the angle I want to go with this is have you have you thought of any legislation that you said hey you know if if I had somebody that was of like mind and can create a bill to introduce to help with the solidarity economy I'm curious if you thought about that and what idea would that be you, you don't have to read off the legislation but you can give me a, a framework of what you think can help build the solidarity um, economy from a governmental point of view? Yeah, I think there are a few different kinds of opportunities. Um, I'll speak to some of my own experience mm -hmm. kind of like doing this work. Um, some of it is, you know, there, there's, mo there's layers to government, right? We have um, hyperlocal, <laughs> like, municipal government, we have statewide government, we have the federal government, we have international government, right? There's layers to this. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, so I, um, after working at the food co-op, and when I started volunteering for the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, I actually stayed with that organization, PACA, for, um, for quite a while. And I ended up serving on its board of directors and then also um, becoming its executive director. And one of the things that became um, central to our goals was getting um, our city council to, you know, provide, uh, to do advocacy work to our local government to help recognize cooperative business cooperative businesses as um, equitable and robust, robust economy building kind of strategy in the city of Philadelphia, right? And so part of what, you know, there, there's kind of like this way in which you got to even get like government to recognize that this stuff exists and where it does exist, um, what, how is it benefiting? What's the data to show that it can be impactful and effective? You also, and so like a lot of our work was was rooted in advocacy to be like, hey, we're here. And then because we are here and we have like these active and thriving, um, a business model that is active and thriving around um, cooperatives in Philadelphia and the region, can you invest, right? So we were in cities across the United States. Um, there's a researcher, her name is Stacy Sutton, 
and she has been um, kind of compiling these um, municipal level um, engagements around building out solidarity economy, particularly around looking at um, how cities are supporting worker ownership, worker ownership and worker cooperatives. Um, so you can look at models from New York City. They've been involved in doing that at the municipal level for probably about a decade or so more, investing like millions of dollars, right, to make sure that these businesses can receive technical assistance, that they are getting um, access to capital to establish these businesses, um, and that they're also like thinking about, you know, in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, I remember there was a, um, a guy for the longest time, he wanted to help form a, um, a health insurance cooperative, but there's actually legislation in the state of Pennsylvania that prohibits that from happening. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. Right. So, so that's something so, that can be uh, hopefully proposed and get that figured yeah. out at some point. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, and so, and so even, you know, looking at um, some of the work that has happened at the federal level, um, the federal in, the United States government has um, probably um, at least since the parts of the early 20th century, you know, a lot of, you can look to the federal government, and cooperatives as um, and give thanks to that relationship between fe the federal government and cooperatives for electrifying um, rural America. Rural America um, it got, you know, funding to do, to electrify itself through the organization of cooperatives because big business didn't want to make those investments. And yeah. so the money, the government said, OK, then we'll give it to the communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we see the federal government kind of having played a significant role in that with cooperatives. We know that the federal government provides a lot of funding towards agricultural cooperative engagement. And so there's a lot of activity now saying like, all right, well, we, the United States has, um, I think, something like 700 worker-owned cooperatives now. Um, and so over the last decade, there's increasingly been um, policy and, and um, advocacy work and lobbying work to help support worker-owned cooperatives, right, um, particularly to help get them capitalized, right? Mm -hmm. So for a long time, the Small Business Ad Association Administration, SBA, wouldn't lend um, mm -hmm. to worker or employee-owned businesses. I mean, in part, it was just in part, you know, a lot of lenders say that you have to have a guarantor, a, a guarantor. So you need mm. one person who, if all of this doesn't work out, this person is going to have to pay us back. <laughs> we need their collateral. Mm. Yeah. And when you have a cooperatively owned business, there isn't just that one person, right? Mm. So there's been like a lot of um, advocacy to support the SBA in learning how to navigate lending to um, small businesses, but also um, leveraging their internal infrastructure to provide more technical assistance to businesses that want to form cooperatives, right? And so um, there's a lot of activity happening, around, bipartisan activity actually happening around that um, at the federal level as well. I know, I was just looking up, um a clip that I, I clipped uh, a couple weeks ago about Ro Khanna, he actually introduced a bill. There's a new push to make it easier for workers to create cooperative businesses in the Bay Area and across the country. South Bay Congressman Ro Khanna announced a new bill to promote and expand co-ops at a slice of New York pizza restaurant in San Jose. Now, the owner says he wanted to find a way to help give workers a piece of the financial pie and formed a worker co-op in 2017. Congressman Khanna says his bill will help other businesses do the same. You said no, when we do well, when we're selling a lot of pizzas, the folks who are putting the pizzas in the box and are making the pizzas and who are cleaning up, who are creating all the value, they should get a, a part of the actual profits. They should be uh, equals to you. I mean, that's really what you've stood for. Now, Rokana's bill would make it easier to convert a small business into a co-op and it would smooth the way to get financing from the SBA including a $60 million loan program. That's definitely an example of um, where a solidarity uh, economy can 
hopefully use government to grow. And you gave some uh, great examples. I've heard about municipal broadband, which is also yeah. local governments trying to um, create cheap, high speed internet for the local communities. While, you know, a lot of places like where I live in New Jersey, you have Comcast, Verizon, who are monopolizing or duopolizing um, the local internet. Like there's only two or three different places that you can get um, high speed internet from in a lot of different areas and municipal broadband will definitely help uh, bring down the prices for that. I, I wanna wrap it up as we spend our last maybe uh, nine minutes or so. I wanna ask about a case study of if I came to you right now and as much as you can, I know um, I don't want you to give away all your secrets and, stuff, uh, uh, and, and things of that nature. But if I came to you, I saw your website, I said, hey, you know what? I'm coming up with this mutual aid party initiative and i need to know how do i build the leadership structure from right now is just two of us but i want to grow um in the next year to maybe 10 people i want to create my bylaws but i don't want it to be a traditional corporate structure with a board of directors and a, a president um i'm coming to you i called you i need some consultation how can i yeah. uh, how can you help me before I get into that, I just want to say um, a resource to consider is the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives and the okay. National okay. Cooperative Business Association. Um, they've a long time been um, in partnership around the Main Street Employee Ownership Act, where you can find out more about some of this federal legislation for um, employee ownership. Nice. Thank okay. you so much. Now to your, um, to your question, I'm going to bust your bubble. Uh-oh. There are a lot of ways to legally incorporate organizations in the United States. And depending on the type of formation you are going to create, you might have- 501 C4, just to let you, you know. You're gonna have to have a board of directors. Okay, interesting. So I can't have that, like say, hey, I wanna have a board of facilitators. No, there's gonna oh, be wow. paperwork that's gonna legitimately just ask you who's your board president, chair, treasurer, oh. and secretary, I'm pretty sure, that you're gonna okay. have to like name that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Now, what that means and how you interpret that and how you relate to one another within your organization, there's a lot mm -hmm. of options for how you mm -hmm. can um, navigate what those roles actually mean and what they, okay. what real power is, um, provided to them. Um, so if you are two people, <laughs> your first step, of course, is finding the rest of your people, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. right? You need help. You got to get you a know, team. <laughs> yeah. My experience, a lot of people mm. always want, you know, it's like, I got me and my boy, we're going to do blah, blah, blah. Or me yeah. and my girls, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And then they'd be like, I need a lawyer and I need to incorporate. And I'm like, y'all ain't got no people. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Okay. So find your people. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a bunch. But if you're saying you want 10 people, then you need to like figure out how you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, you also, I think there's a lot of work that needs to happen around answering these questions of how do you want to be together? Right. So when okay. you think about if you do have to, you're, if you're forming um, a C4, there are like just some straight up rules and regulations that you have to follow <laughs> so that you don't get in trouble and get your tax status revoked or, you know, end up having to pay some fines or something. Right. Like this one's legit things that you just don't have to do. But you also have to be thinking, I think, you know, if you're wanting to show up in the solidarity economy, with that kind of work, then you're gonna to have to go back to thinking about those values that I mentioned um, around cooperation, um, democracy, et cetera, and really start thinking about what does that look like and how we relate to one another, right? So it could be that, um, you know, when before we, and, and to start doing some of these activities together before you formally like incorporate as something, right? So mm -hmm. let's say you get a group and now you're five people who are meeting on a regular basis to talk about what it is that you want to do and how you're going to do it. Um, you need to know how you're going to make decisions together. 
right? Mm-hmm. If you have mm-hmm. five, it doesn't mean that just because three people want it, that that should happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. That's one expression of democracy, but that's a pretty limited um, expression of democracy when you have five people in a group mm-hmm. and two people who don't, you know, who aren't on board yeah. with what you're doing, right? Yeah. So yeah. there are other ways of coming to decision making, whether it's through consensus, whether mm-hmm. it's through consent, <laughs> okay. right? There are just different models and you're going to have to decide how do we decide. That becomes like a very fundamental thing to get at before you do much of anything. You saying that brought me to uh, what I asked earlier and I forgot to get back to because mm-hmm. you talked about how there can be an alternative to a, a majority uh, a democracy where the majority decides. And that reminded me of what you what you just said, where you have five people with three. Um, Two people yeah. do not want something, but you could just give me one example of what would somebody do in that situation outside? Because I could, I can't even fathom that. Like I can only think of a democracy where majority rules. So I'll, can you give me a, an alternative example? Um, for your group or within like uh, uh, not necessarily my group, but a group. It could okay. be any organization that has like okay. five people and two people disagree. So like, what do they do? Sure. So I can I can give an example, a real life example that I experienced. Um, I'm on a a board of directors, um, and we had um, I don't know what are there. I think there are, there are I don't know ten or twelve board members on this board. I am one of them, and we had a topic that we couldn't. We it was like for over a year we really struggled to like agree on this thing. Mm-hmm. And so because we couldn't agree, the staff at the foundation um, kind of felt like maybe their work was slowing down a bit and started mm-hmm. to just have like passing concerns because the board was like not quite moving at the same pace as the work. And so what we kept coming to was that when we needed to talk about this issue, the board couldn't agree. And because we couldn't agree, we couldn't move. We were stuck. <laughs> We were stuck. Um, so I um, I know that there are other ways other than saying yes and no, I agree, or doing majority rule, or everybody has to agree before we move, move on something. It's called mm. consent, <laughs> mm. right? Um, okay. There's a, a, a practice um, or framework called sociocracy. Okay. Um, that you can learn more about this, but consent really is about your range of tolerance for something. Mm, It isn't whether you believe in it, you agree with it, you think it's like, or you disagree with it and you think it's the worst thing. It's consent asks, basically, what is your range of tolerance? If we move forward with this, is this going to make you quit? Mm. Do you think this organization is going to fall apart or we're going to cause irreparable harm because we move forward with this? Mm, if that is not your opinion, then you can give consent for it to move forward, mm-hmm. right? And maybe you have some um, some checkpoints or milestones or ways in which you want to check back in as a group to see if you mm-hmm. want to continue with something, um, to evaluate or assess how it's going, how it, how it's turning out. But once you give consent, you also can't be in the way of it happening. Oh, okay. Okay. It's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't take us all having to understand the same thing the same way. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to like totally agree that it was like the best wonderful thing that could ever come to be. We also didn't have to say, I think this kind of sucks and Mm -hmm. therefore not do it, right? There was a way that people can move forward. So we were in that board experience, for example, we brought this forward and we say, we know that, you know, we don't all understand this the same way. We still have some learning to do about it, but there is something that we can all hold on to about it. That seems like it's moving in the right direction. Mm. Right. And so we shouldn't just say that this shouldn't happen because, you know, um, we don't all understand these words or what it's going to look like exactly just yet. 
we can trust that we know enough mm-hmm. to give it a go. Like okay. I can tolerate it. I can okay. tolerate it. Right. Gotcha. It's a different way of making decisions. Mm, okay. Very interesting. So I was thinking, and I, I'll throw you uh the the governance or the bylaws that I was thinking of. I didn't know that you had to have a board of directors, so now that changes a little bit. But I was thinking of um I had the vision for this initiative. So I was thinking, okay, I'll be like the head facilitator, and maybe every two years the the group can decide whether to vote the head of facilitator out or not. Where I think it's important to have someone who has a vision to be able to implement that vision, even though there might be some disagreements, but Mm -hmm. that disagreements can be um, heard when there are, and maybe it's once a year, maybe, you know, I'm thinking every two years, they can vote that person out. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, whoever is that head facilitator is still listening and taking in the ideas and can possibly um, uh, uh, implement different ideas. And maybe they can decide you know what, this idea of me implementing AI or uh, solidarity currency this way, everybody's against it. So instead of me, um, who I might want to continue being the head facilitator, okay, let me decide not to do this mm-hmm. anymore. Um, so that was what I was thinking of initially, but you gave me a couple um, new things to think about that I'm definitely would want to look into. And and luckily so far, me and my guy, Marco, who is my partner in this initiative, we work together really well. Uh, we meet up once a week um, and we've been doing that for over maybe a year. Recently, we've been meeting up more frequently, but I've chat with him for over a year. So he's a great guy. So we'll see um, where that goes. Mm-hmm. But uh, th- thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you, Jamila. Medley, she is once again an organizational development consultant, leadership coach, and educator, advocate of the solidarity economy. Is there any last words before we uh, head out of here? Well, thanks for letting me like nerd out on my favorite things. This was yeah, awesome yeah. for your questions. Um, yeah. yeah, and just you know, talk about it. Like talk about all of it, right? As you're coming together and you're making this, you know, trying to build new things and, um, you know, trust, um, trust oftentimes needs to be earned. And because so many of us um, have been, have you know, we've got generational traumas amongst communities of color. Um, we, we have a, 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 I would say a, a problem with trust right? We don't just give people our trust. We have to like establish ways in which we can build trust amongst each other. Um, and so I would say move at this, at the speed of trust, mm-hmm. Okay. right? With whatever it is that you're doing, move mm. at the speed of trust. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's a great advice. And as I wrap it up, um, for those who don't know the Mutual Aid Party initiative is basically going to be a website uh, and it's modeled off of a help desk where people can create tickets and it will be called mutual aid tickets. People can, um, hey, I need help um, with uh, my cards not running anymore. You can put in a ticket and then if hopefully we get big enough, I would love for us to get to as big as a million people users going to the site where you can find somebody in the neighborhood who might be good with cars and they'll say, hey, I can come and help you out. And the idea is that uh, money is not exchanged, but like I was thinking of, and it's not implemented in the beta version of the site, but to have, um, you'll be building up that mutual aid credit that you're helping people. And is also not only important that you help people and answer tickets, but that you ask for help. Cause I'm sure Jamila would um, confirm with that, that is not, this is not um, charity. You know, charity is a whole different system where, Rich people's top down. Rich people give away their rich their money, and they're just given, given, um, given. But it comes with some kind of, you know, incentive. Where mutual aid is, we want you to give and help other people, but we also want you to ask for help, whatever that may be. 
and it could be you know asking hey i just my somebody just passed away and i just need somebody to talk to that could be a ticket that yeah. somebody could call you over the phone so that's hopefully um what we will be building in the future and then you'll be able to create teams and i would encourage um teams to have their own structure just like what jamila uh, talked about where you can decide how you want to structure your team hopefully in a um horizontal way where everyone has this, uh equal power and then you just decide all the nitty-gritty of how people express that power but uh thank you so much again for yeah. coming on the show i hope you learned something audience from this discussion let me know if you have any questions and uh, and maybe we can shoot it for a future interview and uh everyone have a great day thank you jamila medley you have a great one thank you